How's it going everybody? Today we're going to be talking about PETA's latest call to action article that encourages people to urge the two food companies Impossible Foods and Hampton Creek Foods to stop animal testing. The article seems to have ruffled some feathers for consumers who have considered these two companies in particular to have a commitment to ethical standards. Now to understand the context of why Impossible Foods and Hampton Creek decided to make this choice to do animal testing, we need to wrap our heads around one very important concept in the US food system. Grass, generally recognized as safe. This is the phrase that the FDA uses to describe food safety standards for food additives in the US food industry. So basically how this happens, and it may come as a surprise, but it's actually business as usual in the food industry. You have, you know, company A develops an additive that they want to add to one of their products. At this point, they're not required to submit it to the FDA for FDA approval. What they do is they hire scientists like, you know, outside firms that have the ability to test whether this additive is safe for human consumption. So basically they take all the conclusions from the scientists, they you know, make it look all nice and put it in a manila envelope and they ship it off to the FDA and say, you know, look, here's the additive that we're going to be using in our products. All these scientists concluded it was safe. We're moving forward with bringing it to the public consumer market. So here's where the plot thickens because the FDA also gives companies the option to send them all this information and the FDA will review it and then if they don't have a problem with it, they will send the company a letter saying, we have no questions, you know, regarding all the information that you sent us. Or the FDA will reply with a letter that says, we have some questions about what you sent us. So why would a company even put themselves in that position to send them something that the FDA might have questions about? Because the food industry is more apt to be more accepting of a product with a new food additive if the FDA sent that letter saying no questions asked we looked at all the information we don't have any questions it's it's all business as usual in the food industry now in the case of impossible foods they had this secret ingredient called soy like hemoglobin and that is a derivative from the roots of soy plants that they can turn into what is essentially an analog for heme iron it makes the burgers that they make taste like juicy. Where this all kind of took a turn is that on August 9th, 2017, uh, Business Insider released an article saying that uh, Impossible Foods did not receive the no questions letter from the FDA. Letter number one, the good letter. So that was their concern, Business Insider's, you know, reason for writing the article. But in that article, you know, it mentions that there was animal testing done. So the public was not aware of that up until this point. This is where, you know, PETA would have become interested. Now, the next day, August 10th, CEO Pat Brown released, you know, a heartfelt letter explaining the dilemma that the company faced, uh, you know, wanting to get this FDA no questions letter and how they had tried to do that once before, you know, and the FDA had the questions. They sent them letter number two, the bad letter. And so they made the decision to move forward with animal testing because they knew that that was going to help in the process uh, to get them where they need to get to get to letter number one. So in this heartfelt press release that CEO Brown put out, you know, he talks about how it was a dilemma. They didn't want to do animal testing when they received letter number two from the FDA. They decided that they were going to have to move forward with animal testing, that they were very critical uh, of the firms that they were looking at that would do the animal testing and went with the one that they felt would do it the most humanely as possible. Fast forward to just a few days ago and PETA, you know, comes out with this thing and they say that they, they're not buying it. In PETA's call to action article, they're essentially saying the feasibility that, you know, this was humanely carried out is unlikely because the industry standard for animal testing is abhorrent conditions, and when the rats are killed after the experiment is complete, the industry standard is to kill them not through euthanasia, but thwack him against the wall. I mean, what it comes down to in CEO Brown's press release is essentially, you know, he's saying, 
it was a dilemma. We wish this wasn't how it was. We did the best we could. So now as a bit of a counterpoint to the experience Impossible Foods had with the FDA, recently Hampton Creek Foods was just granted letter number one, the good letter from the FDA, regarding Hampton Creek Foods' mung bean protein isolate. This is like soy protein isolate or pea protein isolate. Now Klaus, here at Plant Based News, recently had a chance to interview the CEO of Hampton Creek Foods, Josh Tetrick, and Tetrick said that basically there is a de facto requirement for the FDA to respond with letter number one, the good letter, that requires, doesn't require, but is basically a de facto requirement that there be these animal tested digestibility studies done for any given additive that will be added to a product for the food industry. So what this all kind of comes down to is these companies would not require animal testing to illegally sell their product. But the way that the food industry is set up, you know, you have to think about when Hampton Creek Foods or Impossible Foods is trying to bring their products with like hemoglobin, mung bean protein isolate out there to food distributors that, you know, get it out there in big grocery stores, uh, restaurants, things like that. You know, they go to the distributors, they show them the product, they show them the list of ingredients. The distributors are like, okay, well, you know, I know what soy protein isolate is. What is, what is mung bean protein isolate? And then, you know, the person from Hampton Creek Foods is telling them, oh, you know, it's this wonderful bean that the human race has been utilizing for the past 4,000 years. It really helps us achieve the consistency, the flavor that we want to make our products really taste great and to uh, be competitive with the traditional animal-based products. And so, you know, the whole time the distributor's going, okay, yeah, okay. And then, you know, the Hampton Creek representative drops the bomb and we just received FDA no questions letter, letter number one. And this is where, you know, I don't know, I assume the food distributor representative perks up and says, oh, okay, of course, you know, FDA letter number one, the good letter, no questions. Well, you know, if the FDA doesn't have any questions, we don't have any questions. We love your product, it looks great, it tastes great, let's do business. Now, in Klaus's interview with Josh, you know, Josh had, uh, I guess, kind of a similar response maybe that Pat Brown would have in that press release, in that, you know, Josh is saying, this is not the ideal, it's not optimal to have to do animal testing, but basically what it comes down to for us is we either do the animal testing and jump through these hoops, or we just don't sell the product. And for a company in their position, they're choosing the option of selling their product. Klaus, of course, asked Josh about the PETA article and how Josh feels about those types of things. Josh basically said, you know, I do completely understand when people hear about these things that they, you know, have concerns. And essentially he's just kind of hoping that when people do hear in context the the reasoning behind the choices that they've made, the consumers will understand and, and feel a little bit more comfortable trusting the company to be doing, you know, what they claim to be doing, which is making the best ethical choices that they can possibly make, while at the same time ensuring that, you know, their business doesn't fail. In PETA's Call to Action article, they point out several companies that, you know, have claimed to have never done animal testing. Now, something of note is Josh pointed out to Klaus that, you know, a lot of the products that those companies make contain this ingredient called xanthan gum that has grass classification. So I was like, okay, I'll look up xanthan gum and see if I can see the, uh, you know, the reports that, it, were submitted for xanthan gum. Xanthan gum has been around for decades and there's many different companies now that produce it and they have little tweaks on how they process it and stuff. The first Google result when I searched for this was a report that was submitted to the FDA by a company, scrolled through it, boom, right there, tested on rats. At this point, I went to my fridge and in, in my freezer I had a Gardein Pizza Pockets. Uh, in the fridge I had Yves pepperoni slices and follow your heart uh, Caesar dressing. I looked at the ingredients, all three of them contain xanthan gum. Perhaps also of note is that, you know, I noticed that in the call to action article from PETA, they listed Amy's Kitchen brand along with these ethical companies in which PETA says their products have all been developed and brought to market without harming animals. And possibly many out there know this, that Amy's Kitchen brand has many products in their lineup that contain dairy. So, yeah. 
I did reach out to PETA and ask them questions about this stuff, and they responded, but asked, you know, when I needed to buy, and I said, you know, as soon as possible, obviously, to, you know, we want to get the video up here on Planet Based News. So, when they respond, you know, oh, I'm sure Klaus will figure out a way to, you know, post their response somewhere. So, you know, considering this potential contradiction, uh, where does this get folks, you know, concerned with whether companies are testing on animals? Well, you know, it's not good. It's certainly not ideal. There's a shared responsibility of companies that claim to have ethical standards and consumers that claim to have ethical standards. It really doesn't matter what side of that coin you're on. The only way that change is going to occur is if there's a demand for change. In consideration of that dynamic, you know, people on both sides, they have the capacity to work in a world that is imperfect. You know, because to head where we need to head, we have to. Okay, well, you know, none of this stuff is open and shut, so I would love to hear what your thoughts are in the comments below. Thanks, have a great one.